Many thanks, Kun, and thank you again to you and your ministry for the support you have been providing to the series. It's interesting that a number of the things on which you've been reflecting have actually emerged in a number of the meetings before this one, issues around you know, capacity, sequencing, timing, um, how we um, reconcile the different tensions in the transitions have been explored throughout the series and they keep resurfacing and you know we, we I think the series has provided us with an opportunity to um, untangle some of these discussions but it, it really signaled the, the need you know to identify mechanisms and uh, and capacity also in the international community to tackle them you know more robustly but let's open the floor to discussion I'm a bit um, concerned about the number of people and hands I already see if you agree I'd like to extend the duration of the meeting to quarter to three so we have a little bit more time for discussion um, we have about you know, 40 minutes so that will allow a few more questions to be raised but please do keep your questions and comments brief, say who you are and if you have any uh, um, affiliation, speak in the microphone because the event is being streamed online and I also welcome our colleagues who are following the discussion online to send their questions, our communication team will feed them to us. Um, let me start that way, the gentleman there. Um, hi, my name is John, I work for the NGO Solidarity. Um, a few weeks back, Lise Grant was speaking at LSE. She was talking uh, uh, quite a lot about the South, of course. Um, security, economic issues, and uh, the hunger gap were the three things that she highlighted. I just wanted to pick up a little bit on security. That seems to have been spoken a lot about today. Um, and ask, uh, ask uh, a little bit about the funding behind uh, the LRA, the extraordinary level of insecurity that seems to be taking place at the moment and the extraordinary uh, levels of uh, intertribal fighting. Um, and, and what lies behind that at the moment, uh, Lise Grand, when she was talking, said uh, it, was, it was not really understood quite, quite why the levels were, were as high as they were during this time. Uh, and then secondly, I'd just like to ask, uh, as demonstrated on the, on the graphs by Amira, it was, uh, it was shown that Sudan's economic growth uh, has continued over, over the last years. Um, and yet the funding requests that come in still are extraordinarily high. Um, just to ask the question, is it possibly the case that uh, governance in Khartoum is using humanitarian funds to subsidize what should be sovereign responsibility? Thanks. Thanks. Margie at the back and um, Wendy here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Fascinating presentations. Uh, one of the issues that perhaps I was expecting to hear more about, or I'd be very interested to hear in the discussion, is something about the role of um, reconciliation work in the post-conflict period. I think it was touched upon, but um, I'd be very interested, particularly in Luca's perspective, on whether actually there was more going on during the war in terms of local level reconciliation. And I wonder if this was a forgotten issue when the focus was so much on building the state and the consequence that has had on um, at least one of the reasons why intertribal conflict has become so prominent now. So that was one, one question I'd be really interested to hear more about. And the second is, um, it's kind of what can we learn from the experience of Southern Sudan for Darfur? Um, sometimes it's surprising how little learning there is within one country. And I suppose it's especially what can be learned for what can happen in Darfur now, um, whilst there is no functioning peace agreement. Um, and so what can be done now to prepare for the post-conflict period, um, even when peace is still a long way off. And I guess I'm also slightly bemused by the use of the, ter use of the term early recovery, which makes a lot of sense in southern Sudan, but is also being used in the context of Darfur where there is no peace. And it's how do we make a distinction between what early recovery means in those two contexts. And I guess the final thing is really a plea. I sometimes think we get far too caught up with the um, labels that we give to different types of aid. And I wish we would focus a little bit more on the context in which we're trying to deliver aid. Um, I think the labels often hamper us when if we focus more on the context, perhaps we come up with um, some slightly more appropriate interventions. Can you please identify yourself? Oh, <laughs> I'm Margie Buchanan-Smith independent uh, 
researcher and consultant. Thanks. Um, Wendy here, and then I'll come in the back. Yeah. Wendy Fenton, uh, Humanitarian Practice Network. Um, I'm, actually, Margie said exactly what I was going to say about co taking context as the starting point, which is one of the most important of the fragile state's principles, I think. And, uh, you know, one of the issues here, and I was happy to hear Lucas say that during the war, actually, humanitarian assistance wasn't really as two of the other speakers have categorized it. In the last six, seven years of that war, NGOs worked very closely with the local authorities. They worked very hard. Maybe you would see that as an abrogation of humanitarian principles, but there was a lot of long-term work that was done, long-term thinking, in fact, in terms of building capacity of the local authorities, in terms of looking ahead as to what sorts of services would need to be uh, provided. And so I think we need to be careful, as Margie said, about focusing too much on those labels and looking at the context, looking at what actually happened in this case, looking at what could have been built on um, in that sense, and what sort of funding would have made it, what sort of funding, what sort of aid architecture would have made it possible to build on that instead of having the mess that we've, we've got right now. Thank you. Thanks. Colleague at the back, and you, and then we'll uh, go back to the panel. Squeeze you in as well. uh, thank you so much, Chairperson. Um, I'm glad that uh, His Excellency, the Minister, is here, and we happen to be colleagues at the University of Khartoum, so we know ourselves very well. We used to discuss about the future of Southern Sudan. And it is good that he was very frank, and if I got it right, that uh, the basic services for Southern Sudan was far better during the war than now. You can correct me if I'm wrong. So the question is that, why are things not going right? Things are not going right simply because <laughs> government is part of the problem. I mean the government of Southern Sudan is part of the problem. And I have a paper here which I will give some of the copy I will give to the final. Uh, it is unfortunate I brought few copies. Uh, a minister of, who happened to be from Southern Sudan in the unity government in Khartoum, higher education, wrote an eloquent paper and he is a senior member of the ruling party in Southern Sudan, Dr. Aduk Peter Nyaba. He told the story, I will give you a summary, if you could bear with me a little bit. No, you have to be very brief, there are many be, people waiting I'll to... I'll just be very brief. That two persons met at the border town in the south, one going to Khartoum and the other one going to the south. And during Nimeri September law, Sharia law, the one going to the south told the other one going to the north that please don't go to the north. That why? That when you go to the north, the moment you pick something which has fallen from the ground on the street, your hand will be cut, will be shoved off. And if you meet a lady, and you, you, you'll be stoned to death. And if you have seen, you smell a little bit alcohol, you will have a problem, you'll be lashed. The gentleman going to Khartoum said that, why? Is there no government in Khartoum? The man going to the south said, no, it is the government itself at work. So the insecurity in the south, and I will give the example where I'm coming from. I'm coming from Malakal. The insecurity in the south now, and Luca knows, the government is part of the problem. Because the president of southern can you, Sudan... Can you please come to your question? Because I come, we have many people who would like to join the discussion. I, I will just be brief uh, and come to the question. The government is part of the problem because they are giving lands to other tribes. The government happened to be from a Dinka, giving the land of the Shuluk to the Dinkas, and so on. So if you are giving the land to other people, which does not belong to them, and you are the leader of the South, how do you justify your existence as a government? And people are dying of hunger in the South, whereas the money is being looted by the government in the South. How do you justify your existence? And when you come abroad, you give a human face. But who are you sitting in this global world where everything is clear? So okay, I have I to... I need to cut you. Can you please identify yourself and then I'll give... Okay, you. myself. I'm a member of United South Sudan Party. My name is Carlo Kualakol. 
member of United South Sudan Party. Thanks. We, we, need, we need to move on. There's another question. So, in, in short, the government of the Southern Sudan is part of the problem. It's manipulative, tribalistic, corrupt government. Thank, Thank you. The, the gentleman here now has come back to the panel. Hello, I'm Tim Marchant, uh, retired from the World Bank for the last five years, but I had the, the pleasure of working with Luca about five years ago on the joint assessment mission, particularly in the area devoted to information systems and statistics. And my question is really to, uh, it was, a, it was a, one of the most ex ex uh, exciting but difficult assignments I've ever done. Uh, <coughs> and there were all sorts of different expectations that had to be fulfilled. I, I've been out of the, the scene for the last five years, but you have moved yourself from being a supplier of statistics and information to one of the main users. Uh, I wondered what lessons do you think can, have, have you learnt and how would you consider that the information systems should have been developed differently uh, uh, as a result of uh, the experience of the last five years? Thanks. Um, John at the back and then we come back. Hello, my name is John Bennett. Um, I was uh, very uh, deeply involved in the joint assessment mission a few years ago, and I've subsequently been back uh, to southern Sudan several times. Um, just a, it, it was more a point than a, than a question, although it may become a question. Um, one of the uh, issues that we've looked at a lot, particularly recently with uh, evaluating uh, DFID programs in fragile states, is the tension between supporting state structures, or in other words, um, uh, putting money through state structures, and uh, the alternative which might be supporting uh, what we usually call peace dividends or more visible peace dividends uh, through, for example, the NGO sector. Um, the, the current DFID uh, trend, if you like, is towards uh, supporting um, stabilization through state structures. And, uh, but of course, a lot of this money means it's invisible. Uh, it, it's not as visible, if you like, as, as uh, service-oriented uh, uh, support. And I think this is one of the inherent problems with, uh, with stability uh, thinking, if you like, is that there's, uh, uh, there's, there has to be some kind of degree of visibility of peace dividends. Otherwise, you may go off track, as has happened in, in many of these countries, including Sudan. Uh, and I'm just wondering whether the panel have any comment on that on that uh, that issue. Thank you. Thanks. Who wants to start? I'll come this way afterwards. I'll move. To the okay. um, I'm I'm delighted of uh, having this um, gathering colleagues, friends, and people I work with them during a quite a difficult time and. Go to see you again, Tim and John. I think let me let me focus on the issue of uh, security as a very important issue that we 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 need to look what happened in Southern Sudan, especially during the war. The tribal tension was quelled down, was contained, and and then suddenly you have these. The uh, the upsurge of the uh, of the conflict and tribal tension, and and I think this is this is an issue that that we may need to look at it from a different angles. And I and I think what Maggie said is the uh, I mentioned earlier, looking at the uh, at the grassroots uh, uh, conflict and tension. Um, Southern Sudan, over the years of about twenty more than two decades, you have. Uh, a very hidden tension. I think southerners fought among themselves, even they killed themselves more than with the north. And that created a, a tension that we did not capture very well during the peace agreement. And, 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 and by itself, the, the people decided to, to console themselves, look for the bigger picture of, uh, of getting peace generally, and forgetting the issues of what happened during those. But these tensions are there. Depending on the way the government is supposed to really to handle those ones. I'm one of the people I was looking at the, the issue of social capital uh, between the, uh, the communities exposed to different sort of counterinsurgency. And you could see clearly the, the outside 
shock or counter insurgency building the, the unity among the people. But it was actually being injected within the communities. It started dividing the people to the level that becoming the, 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 the level of hatred among the people. And I think what we are seeing in southern Sudan today is a clear case of, uh, I don't want to term a foreign um, um, hands in unraveling these tensions in different forms and, and, and becoming an issue that we are struggling with. And, and that's why I'm saying that the, uh, the, uh, the tension that we are seeing today is unique, but it's a result of a community of things happen over time. What happened during the, the peace agreement, we focus on the issue of reconciliation as a very important. The reconciliation at the level of the government, because all the systems, all the government in Sudan committed a lot of crimes. And, and we said, let us forgive ourselves. Let us take the experience of Rwanda, experience of South Africa. What could we do differently? So because if you don't address these, 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 these grievances, they will, they will build, the people will cover, but they will come up at a certain point. Now, what is happening is that the Southern Sudan is having is going to the stage of trying to decide its destiny in the 2011, which is not for the interest of other people outside Southern Sudan, and I could say the Northern Sudan. And they use a lot of, a lot of I don't want to be using a scapegoat in order to push everything to the year. But there's no doubt the, 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 uh, the Northern Sudan triggered those things. But at the same time, it's the responsibility of the government to govern the Southern Sudan to, to contain it. I think a lot is needed to be done to be known what is happening in the South today, uh, because what is happening is very unusual. It's very unusual. But for us, we know uh, by the end of the day, we'll be able to, 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 to contain it, especially looking at the traditional authority and looking at of how best we can support them so that they can actually be in charge of their own security. And that's why I was talking about the issue of the uh, shifting the, uh, the, uh, the issue of the traditional authority in terms of the provision of the I think we're working with the UN now in a very good way, and I think DFID is, is supporting certain projects, especially taking Jongole as a good example of how we, with our development assistance, with the UN, what can we do in order to really to have lessons learned and how we can build the capacity at that level in order to contain the conflict. I, I, I think the, and that's why the, the, the whole lot of reconciliation is very important. We, during the war, we manage uh, during the churches, during the civil society, during the women groups, to start promoting investing in the, uh, in the reconciliation process. Actually, one could say the unity of the people of Southern Sudan started with the civil society, the churches, investing in how to reconcile the two major communities, especially the Nuer and Dinka. That resulted eventually the unity of the Southern Sudan and actually having the South having one voice and they reached the peace, uh, the peace, peace agreement. So I think it's, a, it's an issue that we... We, we, I just want to highlight. What are the things, what are the lessons we can learn from the South to Darfur? Definitely, when we establish, I think, John is around, and when we are talking about joint assessment mission, we, we say the National multi dollar Trust Fund needed to be reshaped and restructured in such a way to have a window for the, uh, for the early recovery. And I think that's a component that I one would, would really want to highlight, and especially we try to adjust this, the National uh, Multidone Thrust Fund, to have that component for the recovery. Maybe this is something we may need to look at. But importantly, and I think for the, for the NGOs, uh, the whole of that, the humanitarianism, you can use it effectively for early recovery. I think this is the lessons that I learned. As much, for example, investing in tissue, just a tissue, or a health, a health workers, a nurse, or midwives, <laughs> these are institutions. I mean, investing in them, this is, this is by itself, I think this is a big, it's a big early recovery. So that when you go later on, so you have a very qualified people who can really pick up those, uh, do, those issues. Um, now, I, there's no doubt my colleague from Sudan, definitely the government should be held responsible for whatever happened. But I think that one should be seen in context also. When we, I know the Southern Sudan now is being projected, the issue of, of corruption, the issues of uh, insecurity. But these are the things going actually to the level of the building the capacity of the state. This is what we mentioned earlier. And imagine what we are handling now, you have a civil service consuming most, almost about 40%. Even cleaning up, I think Amira mentioned it, just cleaning who actually is there for the civil service. 
just identify whether, whether those people are delivering or not. So cleansing just the payroll is just a big, a, big, a big issue. Leave alone for you to set up the system itself. And I think these are the things to do with, with issues of the, who is delivering about the capacity in the system. We are starting now, within a four years' time, at least now we have, we have all the institutions, we have the author general, we have anti-corruption uh, commission, but that one will take, will take time. The whole lot of, the, of the, the role of the government in conflict, definitely, there is no any government which can survive without providing the minimum thing or protecting its own people. And I think whatever people would be saying that the government is part of the, definitely, that you have people, but you have government, you have individuals who could not be the same like the government. But I think the very fact that the, for a government to survive, it must protect its own people. But any, any argument that is saying that probably the government is part of the whole exercise, definitely these are perception, and one could, could also uh, agree that the, uh, there could be malpractice here and there. But overall, <laughs> it is this the very government that was fighting the war in order to change the, the system in the north. If there's a window of opportunity for change in Sudan today, it's coming from the south, because this is the south that decided to go for the global values of justice and equality and peace. And you can imagine that woman who was arrested, simple because she was wearing a trouser. At a certain point, there was no even for her to talk. <laughs> Today, if you see Khartoum, Khartoum is changing for better. Although with these, these situation of Sudan becoming uh, just a very nasty world, what positive things are happening because of the people of Southern Sudan. Well, these are the people I believe one day they will change, not only themselves, they cannot govern themselves, but even they change the whole of Sudan. I think, Tim, concerning the information, after we finish, we, we have been using a lot of information, and I think one of the good things that we use in the, uh, in the, in the population census, that was a very big support to, the, uh, to the, what we started. And that has built the capacity of the, of the, of the information system in, in, the, in the South. But at least now, we have very good information about, especially what, what, what Amira was talking about, the, about, the, about the, uh, the information gaps is actually narrowing now. Even we are now getting into, with the, with the, with the population census, we are now getting to the household budget uh, survey, which is now getting in. And where, to what, how, what level are we using this information? It still is a challenge. The allocation process itself is a problem. And to what level are we guided by the information? I think that will need a lot of, a lot of work to be done. And, uh, and, and I think at least what we know, uh, like what Amira was projecting, if you look at the, the basic services, little is being given to the health, education. And we have also the information. But you have here the budget culture itself, a lot that needs to be done. Uh, maybe the last point, John, is about the, uh, about the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the issue of the state structure and then the peace dividends. We are now working very closely with, uh, with all our development partners through the budget sector working group. Mm -hmm. And the idea of budget sector working group is to involve and bring the, the donors to the, uh, to the priorities of the government. And I think it's working a lot, especially in the South. We have been trying even with the Dutch and also with the Norwegians, <laughs> whether we can take one sector, for example, health and education, for a direct support to the government. And, 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 and so that we can learn from there. Still, I believe and I know that the NGOs is a very important. It's one of the lessons I learned that when we're looking for to contract the people to deliver, we're looking for very strange people after the war coming to Southern Sudan. We didn't know them. We know SEA, we know <laughs> Oxfam, we know those. These are, the, these are the NGO organizations that we know. We did not capitalize on that one. And I think even for the experience of Darfur, these NGOs are quite important at the early stage so that you can, these are really, the agencies that can start and they know the context better than in other places. Thank you very much. Thanks, Luca. Amira, there's uh, also another question that uh, I'll add from uh, Louvain University. Um, how do you stimulate local businesses in the early recovery phase? So we can add that to the, um, the range of questions that have already been asked. Uh, thank you. Um, John, in terms of your uh, question on, uh, on uh, the LRA, um, you know, clearly we've seen, um, I think from early uh, February this year when there was kind of a, a perimeter between uh, DRC and Uganda and, you know, and, uh, uh, 
the you know which which wasn't really very successful and what happened was that uh, you know the LRA then just splintered into many different groups and what we're seeing now is 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 the movement of the LRA uh, to to some extent even up mm -hmm. to CAR mm -hmm. uh, right now and entering Sudan and 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 what the the critical elements are is that they normally seem to follow uh, the food distribution patterns that you know it's small mm -hmm. groups of 11 to 15 who are coming in you know wreaking havoc on a population but usually coming in for food now where the funding is behind the LRA I mean you know that's it, it to, you know when I was told that the LRA I mean, you know, people say that the LRA is is probably 400 or 500 strong and when you go to you know uh, the, the eastern Equatorian, you see western Equatorian, you see the number of people who've been displaced, and uh, you know for a, for a movement this small, uh, there are issues of you know where actually is this is this uh, funding? I mean I don't have the the answer, but clearly you know groups of eleven or twelve are sustaining themselves through this kind of banditry. Uh, but then I think there are larger issues of you know uh, where where they're being uh, supported from. Now the issue in terms of Sudan's growth. And uh, you know the high levels of, of humanitarian assistance that are being appealed for. I think Luca kind of uh, touched on it a little bit. That the encumbrances on the budget, uh, as as he said, for the wage bill and other things are so large. Uh, and to a certain extent, I think the humanitarian community has always responded in terms of a humanitarian imperative. So if I might say so in front of uh, Luca, I think it's convenient in a sense for the government because they know that the international humanitarian community will step up in terms of you know humanitarian assistance be it life for life saving assistance uh, and so that's why i don't think that we see that responsibility coming from the state and obviously we're pushing very much for the state we saw this recently in darfur when the ngos were expelled that all of a sudden you saw you know for the first time transfers taking place from khartoum uh, to the Darfur states in, ter in terms of you know, budgetary support to, to, to make up for the gap. So I think under pressure, yes, but it should be systematic. And I think we, we try and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, advocate for that all the time. Uh, Marty, on the question of local level reconciliation, I mean, I think Luca has, has touched on that. But let me just say a little bit more about I, what I think that we can learn from South Sudan to Darfur. Few things. I mean, I think one is we must be very conscious of the aid dependency mentality. I mean, we've got to be able to get away from from that, and that's what happens in a protracted situation. Darfur, we're already five, four or five years on. We're de-skilling people; they're losing their skills of livelihood. I mean, I think uh, so. Even in 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 camps, particularly in Darfur, I mean, I think we're very conscious of of the need to maintain the livelihood skills. Uh, you know, there's environmental impacts of, of the large, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, people living in, 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 in the camps. Brick making, you know that better than anyone else in terms of the livelihoods and what that does to the environment. So I think there are lots of lessons that we, we want to take, uh, you know, from, from South Sudan um, into Darfur. And I think one of the most important issues, and I, I think uh, Luca will also agree with this, is the whole phenomenon of urbanization. Mm -hmm. You know, people do not want to go back to the rural areas, and so there's this huge urban crunch. And uh, my colleague sitting here knows b better than any one of us sitting in, in the room, and we've got to address it. So we know clearly, for example, Kalma Camp, Kalma will eventually probably become a town. I mean, you know, the 90,000 people who are in Kalma Camp are not going to go back to the areas. People will choose an urban setting. So I think these are some of, from, from my perspective, you know, there are many other uh, things to, to look at. But um, And then, you know, on this, uh, you know, for both of you, um, Wendy and, and Marty, I, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. And I wish we could see, uh, you know, sort of uh, all these issues in a continuum and a context. But I'll tell you what the frustration is for me as, you know, whether it's a humanitarian coordinator as a resident coordinator. If I put anything that is, uh, you know, that involves training of five nurses, you know, and I put it in the humanitarian appeal, it gets cut out because it's considered <laughs> development and it's not funded. And that's why I showed you the graph on the funding. If you see food aid, no problem. You know, we're getting one billion dollars of food aid. No problem. The minute I put in, I you know, there might it might be a good idea to have a teachers' training college in you know close to Juba because the people are returning and they knew that they had a teachers' training college in Kenya, so it'll pull them here. Put that in a humanitarian appeal itself. 
put that in a development funding window for the thing, and they'll say, well, now, you know, we need to see how it's, uh, you know. So in that immediate time, who is going to fund a teacher's training college, which is vitally needed? It's neither the develop so it's not for us, but it's, it's, it's the way the aid architecture and way the stra you know, these frameworks are set up that we're getting caught and we're missing out on vital pieces of helping people reestablish their lives and you know, whether it's DDR people reintegrating back. You know, that's, that's the frustration, I think, of, of early recovery. So I fully understand. And let me also tell you that both in Afghanistan and, and in southern Sudan, the best people, I think, in you know, uh, a post-conflict building environment. I mean, in Afghanistan, I think every single minister was an ex-NGO, uh, you know, had worked for an NGO or something. You know, they're trained. They, you know, so so yes, it's it's not. Don't for a minute the, think that we're discounting, you know, what that capacity building is. But it's the larger, you know, the issues. Just on the information and statistics, I just want to make one comment in terms of the census. Uh, if if you had come and seen. Uh, the census uh, data processing center in Rumbek, mm -hmm. you would mm -hmm. not have believed your eyes. It was phenomenal, wasn't it? Yeah. It was, I mean, unbelievable. And you, you, know, you saw hundreds of people working with this data, state of the art. I mean, you know, the, that was, I think, one of the mm -hmm. really uh, major accomplishments of, uh, of, 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 the, of the census. And uh, in terms of local businesses, yes, you know, but again, maybe Luca can answer that because everyone says we go to Juba and, you know, the local businesses and, you know, all the fr vegetables and everything is, you know, and the workers, they're all coming from uh, Uganda or, or Kenya and we're not able to stimulate the local economy. Whether it's a, you know, question of not enough credit, not enough st stimulus, not enough, uh, you, know, uh, you know, development of entrepreneurship, Part of it could be a aid dependency, you know, uh, uh, culture, but a combination of things. And I think we have to do more uh, to 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 revitalize that. That was one of the questions that came up. So let me stop there because we're in the interest of time. Thank you. Just a few additional points. Uh, first, John, you asked about um, how can there be growth and how can you still uh, have uh, re requests for development funding. I think it's a question of the ages in the sense that there are, of course, more situations where it's not just about the overall needs, but it's about distribution. Uh, I do think if you look at the CPA, it, it exemplifies that there is a need to address uh, an imbalance between the center and the periphery in, in, in Sudan in many ways. Uh, so it's definitely an issue. It's an issue we all, we all think about. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's something where you realize that you can't address the needs of the periphery, if I may call it that way, without uh, engagement of, of the government of Sudan. Uh, the the um, second point I wanted to uh, raise is the issue that John Bennett raised on, uh, well, basically, are we focusing on the state or are we focusing on, on immediate service delivery? Uh, I, think the, I think the pendulum tends to swing on this. Uh, but, uh, but I think in the end, the context should determine what we can or cannot do. In, in Dutch policy, there's, there's a range of activities in the sense that we give budget support to Burundi, uh, although that is uh, hotly debated in Parliament, uh, and we, we work through uh, Afghan NGOs, but they deliver within the framework of the National Health Program. Um, and I think we definitely need to uh, be aware of the need to, to, uh, to build the state. Um, there are legitimacy issues of the state. Ashraf Ghani, in his book on, on, on fragile states, of course, raises the, the need for a social contract, etc. Uh, but there, there are smaller issues at work, such as brain drain, in the sense that you can only use the capacities of people in, in so many ways. Uh, so you have to be very careful what you do. And I, I do think the context is very important, uh, and it's very important that you do try to build long-term capacity. Um, the question of... Um, yeah, the last question I wanted to address was the issue of, uh, of, of, of the phases that Amira just, uh, just raised, whether uh, we, we are uh, making it harder for ourselves by talking about humanitarian phases, development phases, etc. It is with us. Uh, it's with us because of, of funding categories that we can't easily change. Um, it's not just on this issue. It's also uh, an, an SRSG who shall remain unnamed who told me during my work on the panel, well, you know, if I don't have the voluntary funding, I call my mission something else so I can still go because then I'll get the assessed funding. Um, so whether it's human rights or political doesn't depend on the situation. It just depends on whether I need the bloody plane or not. That's sort of a literal quote. Um, 
So, so it's, but it's also a question of are you, are you incentivizing the right things in terms of aid dependency ownership, uh, the issues that Amira talked about, and there definitely is a need to, uh, to evolve and to change the responsibilities in a certain context. I think even in a situation like Darfur, where we both were last week, um, you see possibilities for that, or you see developments in that direction, and we shouldn't too easily assume that a system just needs to continue because it's there. You need to build on that system, um, but it's, it's, it's part of what will take us forward. Thank you. I'm afraid you've come to the end of the time. I'm sure the speakers will be delighted to stay and you know, answer your queries after the end of the event, but we are really running you know, beyond time and we need to close here. I think the discussion takes us very nicely to the next meeting in the series, which is on the 12th of November. We will be linked via video conference with Professor uh, Charles Cole of the uh, um, United States Institute of Peace and with Dr. Sarah Cliff, who is the co-director of the World Development Report 2011 on Fragile States, and we'll have Alina Rochamenokal from ODI. And we will discuss about uh, uh, building legitimate and accountable institutions, you know, towards state building. So it follows very nicely from today's discussion. And I hope to welcome all of you back on the 12th of November. But in the meantime, please join me in thanking the speakers today for what has been, I think, a very informed and interesting, stimulating discussion. Thank you very much. Please do come and talk to the speakers, ask your questions, they'll be very happy yeah, to, yeah. yeah.